Missions Pulse. Know God's heart, join his mission. This podcast is powered by Within Reach Global. Subscribe, watch, and listen on YouTube today. Visit missionspulse.com. Welcome back to Missions Pulse. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. Why? Because I think it's going to be a challenge for you wherever you are, regardless of your geographic coordinate, place in life, how you're serving either in church or beyond the four walls of church, uh, to stick with a stick to a stick intuitiveness that is I think something that God wants to put in all of our hearts, that perseverance, endurance, that we can plod through any difficulty or circumstances. And uh, with me today, I have the honor of introducing Mr. Doug Gaiman. He is the uh, president and director of Globe International, also an author, his book, uh, is his new book is coming out very shortly uh, before you quit coming out in March. And wow, I just like to say, Doug, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is great. Talk to you across the world. <laughs> Here we are. I'm in Thailand. Yep. And where exactly are you located right now? I know you're in America. Yeah, I'm in Pensacola, Florida, on the panhandle of Florida. So yes, a few miles from the Gulf Coast. And uh We love living here. Here We've lived here for 25 years since we came back home from the mission field. We were in Asia, lived in Thailand where you are. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's right. Now, how long did you spend here in Thailand? Well, we were there in Southeast Asia for about 15 years. And every one of those years, uh, we were in Thailand at least part of the year. But we lived in Thailand from the late 80s to the early, I mean, the early 80s to the early 90s. Yeah. And well, okay. Well, I, I'm excited to have that touch point. And I think that's a good kind of segue because uh, I'm sure, you know, in the missions world, a lot of people will uh, hear your name floating around, uh, perhaps the legendary hero of rumors. I don't know what they say about you. <laughs> but what is you- that? Yeah, is that what that's what I consider myself the legendary hero of rumors? So may or may not be true, you know. If you subscribe to my newsletter, (laughs) but why don't why don't you catch us up a little bit? I mean, let's go back in time. But you said you've been back in the states, home now, twenty five years. But previous to that, you spent fifteen years. Now we're talking about a legacy life in missions here. If you want the uh, objective truth about it, tell me about your story. Yeah, I I tell people now, you know, when I talk to young people, I said I've been serving in a global capacity for most of my adult life. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, but I was kind of a wild teenager, rededicated my life to Christ at the age of 18 and uh, just before I left for college. And then I got involved in a church in the community where I was going to school and that church was a missions church. And so it was a that's how I got my missions call. An evangelist came to our church and talked about what God was doing in the Philippines and Hong Kong. Um, I had never been anywhere like that before. And I I grew up in countryside. I used to joke with people, you know, I live so far out into the sticks that you had to drive towards town to go hunting. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Off in the distance, it sounds like. Yeah. So hearing about places like Hong Kong and the Philippines was just overwhelming, overwhelming my curiosity. Hmm. And I went to our pastor afterwards uh, and said, I want to go. My my wife and I just got married. I was 20 years old when I married my wife. And and that was our first year of marriage. And I said to my pastor, I want to go there. I heard this evangelist was going back. And I said, can I go along? And he said, well, write a letter to him. That was, you know, before the days of email in the sure. late in the mid 70s. And um, so I did. He called my pastor, said, is this guy safe? Is he you know, weird? And my pastor said, no, he's a good guy. He's a good young man. So I went on this trip. And I tell people now I still tell that story. I said, when I got off that airplane in um, and went into town in Kowloon in downtown Hong Kong in the Chin Cha Choi business district. I saw more people in the first 15 minutes of, of that time that I had seen in my entire life before. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. I mean, those two places, funny enough, are very dear to my heart. My wife is from Manila, from the Philippines. Uh-huh. We've been married 17 years and we met in Hong Kong. While smuggling oh, Bibles. Yeah. So okay. Sim Sa Chui, uh, yeah. obviously the Low Wu border into China. We were 
there often. <laughs> yeah, well, that you know, that's that's where my beginning. I got hooked on Asia. I came back from that trip. I told my wife, who was now pregnant with our first child, that, you know, we weren't even married a year yet, and uh, I said, "We're going to Asia. That's where it's happening." And where, where so, she, what was her response to that? Well, the initial was kind of like wide-eyed, what you know, and we didn't, we didn't go right away. I mean, we, we, I gave her time to to kind of get on board with it, you know, and tried to be the good husband. Um, and uh, so she finally became passionate about it, and we made a couple trips in the the following year in '78. We were married in '76. I made my first trip trip in '77. We uh, took a trip together for three months in '78. And then in 79, we moved over with our first child and she was pregnant with number two when we arrived in Asia. Wow. And uh, my wife became a passionate partner. Uh, we traveled as a family doing evangelistic, uh, we call them crusades, and that, that, that's not as a popular world word today, but we did events with our, we were interns. And my wife loved to travel with me with our two little babies. That's and awesome. And we were poor as paupers, you know, we just had no money. Our, our little baby, Jeremy, our second born, he, he slept in the suitcase. You know, we didn't have a, a pack and play. There was no such thing. And yeah. we probably couldn't have, if there was, we just took the clothes out of the suitcase and laid it on the floor and made a bed out of it. And he slept in that for the first six months of his life when we were wow. traveling half the time. I, I love yeah. hearing stories about that. I mean, you, you're talking about, well, your book that's coming out March is called Before You Quit. And right. the things that you're describing, um, I think, uh, speak to a time when missionary grit was something that was required of you. I mean, you're, you're traveling abroad. You don't have access like we do today, you know, quick routes back home, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc. But it requires some sort of sacrifice, yes, but also a stick itiveness and perseverance. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Our, the leaders that we work with often use that term, stick to hmm. You know, that you're, you're not going to accomplish anything of real enduring value is going to take time to have impact um, and to, for it to develop. You know, today, uh, People know this Malcolm Gladwell, who is a secular business author. He writes about the fact that it takes 10,000 hours to become proficient in something. If you play the piano, it'll take you 10,000 hours to become a proficient pianist. That means that means 27 years if you practice one hour a day every single day without fail. Wow. If you practice two hours a day, it'll require you 13 plus years. So the idea of persevering in ministry and persevering in God's call, I think we, we kid ourselves if we think we can just jump in and become successful. Hmm. Yes. I know one of, the, one of the evangelists that trained us that we worked with in those first three years he plotted for three years before he had a breakthrough, just a lot of hard work. And I was working right beside him, watching him plod through. I talk about that in the introduction to my book and tell his story of just of just dogged determination with lack of fruit, lack of finances, a lack of support. And he was just doggedly determined to preach the gospel to large crowds in Thailand, and he would not give up. <laughs> and eventually, God answered his prayer. Um, but it took him more than three years for it to happen. Wow. So Yeah, well, uh, what I remember when I first moved to China, that was 1998. I uh, was 18 years old, moved to China, and uh, thankfully— came under the wings of an apostolic missionary group. And the motto of our small missionary group was this, we have done so much with so little for so long, we can now do anything with nothing. And it speaks, yeah, yeah. It speaks I mean, every missionary, every cross-cultural worker will resonate with that. But it speaks to that, that plodding. And obviously, yeah. I, I know you, I think you quote it in the book as well, uh, reminiscent of William Carey, father of modern missions, who says, I can plod, I can pers persevere in any definite pursuit. To this, I owe everything. Um, yeah. So is that, is that, 
how we are to see a harvest? Is that how we are to see fruit? I mean, I know there are times when the Holy Spirit allows some quick work to occur, to happen from what we put our hand to. But generally, yeah. typically, is this the thing that God is calling us to, a long obedience in the same direction? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that, that what you just talked, you know, Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Uh, I, I don't want to ever discount that God will occasionally do something profound and quickly because it's in his purposes to do so. But typically, my experience and observation, even from Scripture, um, is that the persons that God uses in what appears to be a quick work, those people went through agonizing things to get to the point where they were ready to handle the glory of God in a way that didn't mistreat and misuse the glory of God and maybe squander it on their own egos. Mm, wow. He had to break those people. He had to he had to nurture them and break them and shape their lives so they were ready to be able to handle the fruitfulness without squandering it. Uh, that's been my observation from Scripture and even in my own life. I, one of the things that Angela Duckworth says in her book, Grid, again, she's a secular author writing for the business world, but she says most of the time when we view success from the outside, we don't want to see the story of what it took to get a person to the point of success. We want our success uh, ready-made, you know, yeah. and so we shorten that timeline in the background of what it took that person to get somewhere, how many hours and hours and hours, and she uses the example of an Olympic swimmer, you know, it looks like he was born that way, he just dove in the water and started swimming and won all kinds of gold medals, and we don't realize that he trained probably for a decade or two before he got to that place. Yeah, I think that happens in most of our memories as we condense the background into almost oblivion and think the success came immediately. That is a great point. And I like how you point these things out because uh, many people will look from afar and say, wow, that guy is successful or she is amazing or Michael Phelps. Wow. How did he do that? <laughs> right. Uh, when in exactly. fact there, there's a long backstory. Uh, obviously there's going to be suffering involved. Glory is along the way. You know, the first book that I wrote was called the space between memories. And it was tackling this idea, this, this thought that right now, here in this present moment, this is the space between the memories that will be made. And I will look back and recollect upon in a decade or two, and they will be beautiful and they will be exciting and glory and, and successes will come out of it. But living in the moment, is that something that you would encourage people to uh, do more of? Yes, and I think I think what drives our lives, what what really keeps us keeps our head up and keeps us moving forward and doing as Carrie, you know, says, I can plod. Hmm. There has to be something that drives us, and for Christians, really at the heart of that is the glory of God. We've had an experience with Christ, and we love Him. We want his honor and glory in our lives. And then when that is almost to the point of being all consuming, it's like that is really what I want. I, I, I'm not driven by the, the desire for money. I'm not driven by the desire for fame. Uh, I'm not driven by the desire by the desire for approval. I want God's glory. And when you have that, you have you have really the resource to be able to walk through those plotting times and the in-between times, as you call them, when things aren't happening and not everything is perfect and not your dreams aren't coming true. Um, and you just have what it takes to get up in the morning and worship the Lord and thank him and still have a vision of something he wants to accomplish that you're moving toward believing that God will bring it to, to fruition in his time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those, those are amazing words. And I consider this as well. I think it's a major underlying motivation, if not the glory of God. Uh, you know, love for the lost will wane over time. I think many missionaries yeah. go, they, they, they hear this emotional call uh, to the mission field or uh, even beyond the mission field. All of us, we have an empathetic call. So love mm -hmm. 
uh, for people. Well, it wanes over time and soon enough, you're going to realize that people are people and you'll be quoting Spurgeon. If I were God and the world treated me as it treated him, I'd kick that wretched thing to pieces. <laughs> it doesn't have that longevity, <laughs> right? right? Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then the command, obedience to the commands of Christ uh, would be another major underlying motivation. However, it could easily become drudgery. If you don't have that underlying or overarching theme of God's glory, yes. uh, it mm -hmm. seems to me there's not a lot of longevity in the call that God has placed upon your life. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, we talked about Floyd McClung earlier. You know, he, he, he emphasizes that in his writings about what he calls apostolic passion, that it has to originate and it's, it's seated in our love for Jesus Christ. Um, our personal relationship with him and our love for him and what, yeah. what who he is to us and what he means. And that is the only thing, because you're right, the world, the world around us and our experiences in the world, whether we are in business or whether or we are serving the Lord in a missions capacity, uh, the, the world and its brokenness will beat everything out of us. Yeah. And if we don't have something to go back to, to lean on, to sit, sit in and bask in and, and for, you know, people like McClung and other leaders who talk about it, John Piper talks about this, is we are seated in the glory of God. That's where we get our, that's where we get this overflowing, what Jesus called out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water. If we don't have access to that and don't maintain a connection with that, we just can't persevere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing the major themes already in your book. I know it's releasing in March, March 3, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's let's take a moment then and do a, a major plug for the book. Tell me um, the, the full title. I know it's Before You Quit. And tell me where can people find I think they could actually purchase it in advance right now. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the full title is Before You Quit, Everyday Endurance, a Moral Courage, and the Quest for Purpose. Uh, and it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Christian Books, and, and a number of other uh, Christian websites. You can go and order it. I think even Goodreads has it. Uh, uh, at least it's there. The, the title or the, the uh, front of the book is featured, and you can pre-order it. Um, so it's it's out there and it's going to be released in paperback, uh, audiobook, and Kindle. Uh, so I think all of those will be ready in March. Good. Okay. But yeah. The, th the theme of the book is perseverance and why we why we persevere. Is this a is this a book for uh, missionaries only? Is this a book for people involved in you know cross cultural service of some kind? No. Uh, it was uh, Moody Publishers asked me to to write it uh, with a young audience in mind uh, and not necessarily. Uh, missions book. Uh, it should apply to really across the spectrum from Christian ministry to business people. But it has a Christ, obviously very Christ centered. Um, the book is built on the premise that our perseverance is based in what Jesus has done for us and the vision that he gives us for our lives that has an eternal, an eternal aspect to it. Um, we are driven by eternal values and eternal consequences. Um, so the book is about that. I, I tried to write it with young people in mind, but it's not, it's not just written for the younger audience. I tried to write it in a way that's timeless. And uh, so uh, I think I've succeeded. Um, uh, one of the Moody publishers pointed out to me uh, somewhat facetiously but it did so in a way that was meant to be a compliment. He said, you know, you don't actually use the word millennial in the book at all. And I said, well, I, I didn't actually know that I, I forgot that I didn't do that. But uh, I wasn't trying to pigeonhole any particular demographic. Well, you can't pigeon, uh, pigeonhole a particular demographic when you're talking about perseverance because you've mentioned already Angela Duckworth's grit, Malcolm Gladwell, probably the tipping point I think you're referring to. And I mean, uh, these these go across the board and a perseverance is something every single person is needing. You know, yes. I think of the people in my life right now, relationships that I have, either they're going through an ugly or difficult divorce uh, there may be a missionary in 
southwest China or in Tibet, trying to reach an unreached people group, regardless of geographical location or demographic or gender, uh, I, I think all of us, humanity, is going to deal with putting your hand to the plow and not looking back. It seems to be a theme that humans are quite weak at that aspect. Yeah, and I, and I mentioned that in the early part of the book. I said, you know, nobody runs a marathon, you know, who, who doesn't want to finish. No one tries to lose weight who doesn't want to look better. No one overcomes alcoholism who doesn't want to be sober. You know, we, we have goals that are hard to attain. Uh, some of them are selfish and some of them are altruistic, but nobody enters into those goals unless they see something that doesn't yet exist that they want to bring into existence. Sounds like you're um, describing faith to me. Yeah, it, it, exactly. As a Christian, it's at, the, it's at the very center of our lives. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We have faith in what God wants to do in the world. We don't see it yet in, in completion. Hebrews 11, the great chapter on faith, the, the, the big over, if you look at, if you really read Hebrews 11, the thing that you see is the word, they saw something. Hmm, they saw okay. something that didn't exist. They, yeah. they looked for a city. They looked ahead for something that didn't exist. Moses looked ahead and saw freedom for his people. Abraham looked ahead and saw a promised land. Joseph looked ahead and saw a kingly kind of a, a leadership assignment that God had given him. All these people saw something that didn't yet exist, and they that's what drove them to go through difficulties to attain that thing. And some of them got it, and some of them actually died before they reached it, but they saw it out there in front of them. I think that's an encouragement that a lot of people need to hear right now, realizing that, yes, we are – C.S. Lewis often referred to this. You're talking about so many authors that I read right now, so I know I could throw out a couple that – I'm sure you've devoured C.S. Lewis yep. uh, seems to be a major theme of many, uh, much of his writing. He said uh, how talked about how we are so transient in, in the world and we're, we're waiting for this eternal home where we can't find satisfaction in our present state because we're not made for this world. We're made for another world or the world beyond. And uh, I think that's the encouragement that people are, are really needing to hear. So I, I'm excited for the release of your book and, um, I think it's going to be a major encouragement to many. Yes. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's our anticipation. I say our because Moody is very uh, enthusiastic about this book. It's a needed message in our culture today. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the tragedies of our time, really, and, and I don't mean this in a critical sense, but it, uh, a great good in our culture, uh, Western culture, a great good is the wealth uh, that we have, the safety that we almost take for granted, um, the privilege that we have today for, through technology and other things that now be, have, make our lives very easy. The, the tragedy of that is it has robbed us of a sense of being able to go through a difficult time and persevere towards a greater good, towards another end, uh, whether that's building a business or creating something that's that's new or going on mission for God or, or even doing something personal for ourselves, we find it hard to persevere because we're so used to an easy life. Hmm, wow. Yeah. And, and, and success comes only through what? Failure. Multiple times, yeah, right? Einstein would have done right. that anyway. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. You know, when we, when, I mean, even secular even secular philosophers uh, and non-Christian leaders like Nietzsche and, and Frankel, you know, Nietzsche said, he said, anyone who understands why they're suffering, they can, they can endure any how. You know, they can, in other words, they can get through it. They can figure out how to get through it if there's a reason behind it. That's funny that Nietzsche, who was an atheist, a German philosopher atheist, in that sense, he agreed with Jesus. You know, <laughs> you know, Jesus gives us reason. He, Jesus gives us a reason that's very deep for us and very meaningful for us. He gives us a reason to endure, and that's for His glory and His purposes to be accomplished. But even non non believing secular people have come to the realization that when someone really has a reason for, they can get through almost anything. Yeah, yeah. Again, it reminds me of the. Simon Sinek talks, Ted, Ted talks, you know, the, the why, 
with the why behind yeah. the what. And um, yes. I, I like how you're pointing people to that Christ centeredness. Uh, I often quote it, David Platt, he said, don't try to manifest a heart or mind for missions that is devoid of relational intimacy. I think your book is pointing people back to the why, and it's a capital W because that why is a person, the person of Jesus. Yeah. And therefore, that strong um, uh, urge, that strong uh, capacity to be able to persevere in any difficulty. Yeah. Well, Jesus, and one of the chapters in the book, um, deals with perseverance in in uh, God's consummate purposes, you know, what what uh, theologians calls the eschatology of our faith, you know, the end times themes of Scripture. Of course, Jesus unpacks a lot of that in Matthew 24. And in, in, in the middle of that chapter, with all the chaos and the disintegration of the world's systems going, you know, happening with natural disasters and wars and rumors of wars, and these are words of Jesus— in the middle of all that, he says, but this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. The irony of that, you know, our natural inclinations are to when trouble comes is to hole up in our houses, stockpile food, make sure we have cash on hand, you know, protect ourselves. And Jesus says just the opposite is going to happen among God's people is during world chaos, there's going to be this exponential rise of world evangelism done by Christians going all over the world at great personal sacrifice to preach the gospel. And he doubles down on it. He says, all over the world to every nation. Wow. I think that's profound. And I think that's a testimony to what is what is going to happen in God's people during difficult times is we, we become the best people we could be during difficulty. And it's because of the great God. Yeah. And, and it seems to me what you're describing is 2020. Now, I know that uh, the end times, uh, it, what Jesus ref was referring to, it perhaps is still some time uh, away. We're in the beginning of the end, you could say, perhaps. But you, you're describing the coronavirus of China right now. Uh, I've been working yeah. in China for 15 years. You're talking about persecution of, of believers. We've seen that, you know, since the days of Nero and beyond. Um and so sounds to me what you're describing is something that is relevant for us today. Mm -hmm. It is. And I, 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 my personal uh, conviction about the end times is, uh, number one, we don't know the, the day or the hour. Jesus is very specific about that. Uh, number two, the Apostle Paul uh, speaks of the end times as something that has been happening since the time of Christ. You know, we're in this last age. So yes. in one sense, we have been living in the end times since the time of Christ. So having a long view, uh, Christians, I believe, need to take a longer view of history and recognizing that God has been working out his plan partly with determination and partly with patience towards human beings. And as we walk with that long view, um, that Eugene Peterson, you know, a long obedience in the same direction, we recognize God has eternal plans. He's both patient and determined in that, in that working out of that plan. And there are going to be difficulties in every age. Um, right now in the West, we, re we enjoy relative safety and prosperity. But there are parts of the world right now, you referred to China, you know, there's other parts in, the, in North Africa that there's starvation, there is war, there is conflict, there's great upheaval, failed states. Uh, this, these things affect, affect human beings. You know, you think about what's going on in Iran and Iraq, for, for, especially for Christians there, what they are dealing with right now. And yet the reports that are coming out of those countries is in the midst of all that upheaval and difficulty and failure of the state, you know, meaning the, the economy and the safety and all the things we take for granted that governments provide. Uh, in the middle of all that, God is doing some amazing things in those countries. Uh, right, the, yeah. church, the church is flourishing, uh, you know, and they look at us um, with a little bit of probably appropriate criticism. You know, they say you folks in the West have no idea what it means to live for Christ. You know, like we, 
And we can learn. We can learn from those folks. You are absolutely right. Um, Nick Ripkin, Insanity of God, often talks about this, you know, how we have so much to learn from our brothers and sisters in chains. I like how a moment ago you talked about Matthew 24, 14, in the midst of all this chaos, and we're seeing the Tal volcano in the Philippines just erupt and evacuations, failed states, etc. What you just mentioned. Then that culmination point in the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony for all nations, and then the end will come. Reminds me of that culmination, Revelation 7, 9, people from every place and tongue and ethnic ethno-linguistic tribe standing there before the throne of God. This is this is where all of history is moving toward. And I kind of yes. want to transition there because I think these are themes and topics that are dear to your heart, are kind of probably the epicenter of much of what you do. Tell me about your role at Globe International uh, and a little bit more about Globe. I know you have uh, missionaries, I believe, in 70 different, more than 70 different nations, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's probably closer to 50 or 60, uh, what we call the Globe Network. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that here just briefly. The Globe Network is a network of agencies based in now six countries that are sending missionaries from those countries. In other words, not just missionaries coming out of North America, the United States, but we have missionaries coming out of Mexico, out of Brazil, out of Germany, Switzerland, the UK. Um, and so, you know, those, the network total, I think we have somewhere in, in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 different nations that we're involved in. Um, so Globe is a, a mission sending agency. The network is a network of sending agencies. We're constantly looking at new nations because it's our belief that um, in the future, you know, the idea that has become somewhat of a cliche in missions uh, vernacular is from everywhere to everywhere. Um, so we believe that missionaries are going to be coming out of every nation on earth. Um, yeah. This is, you know, the historical idea that from the West to the rest, that's an old idea. The new paradigm now that is not, not a future idea, it's a current reality uh, that missionaries, the, the large bulk of missionaries are coming now from uh, other nations. So Globe is trying to get a, to get our head around that. We've been working on that for 20 some years um, and, and saying, how do we facilitate that so that missionaries that God raises up in the Philippines and God raises up in Argentina and God raises up in Brazil and Mexico, we're looking at Malaysia, you know, we're looking at Costa Rica um, to send missionaries from those nations uh, to the world. And how can we facilitate that? So North America, the United States has a part in all of that. God's not going to let us off the hook. Um, we still have to obey the mandates of, that Jesus give, gave, the Great Commission. Um, so Globe is committed to that. And uh, probably our one of our big strengths is we provide the services, the financial and printing and communication services that most missionaries really need. Um, we, we do that. We have state-of-the-art systems so that you know, donors can be, uh, get what they need from their donations and people who pray for and give can receive communication. We try to provide those services so the missionaries are well supported underneath their work on the field. They feel like there's people back at home really taking care of their business for them. Those are some powerful things that you're talking about. I mean, my mind is obviously going in many di different directions because I like the marriage between that global South missionary, we'll call them from uh, African nations, South Central Latin America, the Asias or Asia, Asian nations. And you're able to provide services, things that they need to thrive. I think God is calling people to thrive in the calling he's given them, not just survive. And we all know once you cross a cultural barrier, a linguistic barrier, geographical, it is not easy. And I think most of us, I think perhaps specifically for people who are watching today, think in terms of that Western, maybe American missionary going overseas, like you said, is not no longer the West to the rest. 
Um, so we had the student volunteer movement that thrust out thousands, tens of thousands of missionaries from Europe and, and America. Today's reality is that we are seeing people from all different nations. It's no longer the West of the rest, but the reached to the unreached in, in, in many ways. And yes. uh, what is what is your your word then? What is your call then for Western believers who, yeah, they're not going to be left in the dust and we have a part to play and we are called to help bring about the fulfillment of the Great Commission as well. Um, what is then our role in the Western church? Uh, one of the things that we're, we are trying to do, and it's patient work, uh, is, that is to help the church not see their missions work as only short-term trips. Um, that, that, that one activity has in some ways co-opt uh, the longer view and we're not criticizing. I, I probably personally went through a time of being fairly critical of the short-term missions trip. And finally, the Lord just sort of nudged me and said, you need, you need to get over that. You know, you're not helping people if you're just critical. Um, as a career missionary, of course, I see the value of, of Im the impact you make when you, when you really invest in people's lives. So we're trying to take a positive, a, a positive spin, a positive approach to making the case for career. But just think about that. No matter what country you originate from, let's let's start with North America, an English speaking person originating from US and going to Thailand where you are. Well the first thing you're you have to do that takes perseverance is learn the language. Yep. It's tough. You don't do that on a two week trip. You know your your relationships can be kind of fun. But they're very superficial. You never get past just highs and buys and, you know, so what the crap and you learn a couple of words that, uh, yeah, you learn a couple of things that are exciting, but you don't have a, you don't develop any deep relationships unless a Thai person has learned English and he's jumped over the bridge and done the work. But think about, think about the positive opportunity there. You know, the enriching opportunity to learn another language, go through that too two years, you know, language learning is a lifelong, you never get done, but go through that intensive time of language acquisition and then have this joy of being able to actually relate to people and develop relationships and learn a new culture and be on that adventure of understanding someone, another culture and being able to be a part of God's bridge towards communicating something that you carry. What Paul says, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel, you know, and that earthen vessel kind of stops the treasure from coming out linguistically in terms of energy. You know, we got a eight hours of our day, a third of our day has to be involved in sleep. The treasure is kind of stuck in there. That's the negative side. The positive side of that is that the Lord is, is entrusting entrusting the power and the and the joy and the truth of the gospel to us yeah in other words just like jesus christ incarnated the gospel he came and became a man he incarnated the love of god into a human person through touch and talk and and community and and being with people we are doing the same thing and god is entrusting that to us to me, that is making the case for why long-term relational building through cross-cultural missions is so vital and so powerful. And you're talking in the context, obviously, of missions. I think a lot of what you just said, there are barriers and obstacles to be crossed, regardless if you cross those geographic. If you still stay in America, you're going to have to cross bar bar uh, yes. barricades along the way. And being that incarnation of the gospel is what Jesus calls us to do. But going back, um, I love how positively you talk about language learning. Um, I spent three and a half years learning Mandarin Chinese, and it was no joke, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my teacher was 61 years old. She could say, hello, okay, I love you, and bye-bye. That was the end of her English skills. And I mean, there's four different tones in Chinese. So you say, ma, mother, ma, hemp, ma, horse, ma, to scold with a silent ma as a question mark. So you could literally say, ma, 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 did mother scold the horse? And 
and I made a lot of errors along the way. I mean, pastors would come. I'd be translating for different pastor speakers at a conference for Chinese uh, underground believers. And they'd lean over to me before the service starts after worship was ending and saying, how, how do you say, um, praise the Lord? Uh, they want to start with this, praise the Lord, and then continue into yeah. it. And I say, Gan xie zhu. Gan xie zhu. that's how you say, praise the Lord, and, uh, or thank the Lord. And they'd say, Gan xie zhu, praise a pig. No. Just a slight intonation and pin drop silence. So, but, uh -huh. but those years of efforts and struggle, man, it was beautiful and glorious. And now what do I see from that? These relationships that have lasted for years and over a decade and a half, almost two decades. Churches mm -hmm. being planted, disciples being made, people being one to Christ in gospel-deprived areas that have never had yes. heard the name of Jesus. So I think I really love how you're empowering that positive aspect of only focusing on language learning, but crossing into different boundaries uh, and yes. incarnating the gospel. Yes. And if people can catch the opportunity that they have, you know, God, the, the idea of unreached people uh, and unreached people groups, groupings of people that are either ethnically and language linguistically tied to one another, and there's no witness there, think Think of our listeners today of this podcast, and yeah. one of them says, I want to be the guy. You know, I want to be the William Carey yeah. to those people. I want to be the Jesus the Jesus to them. I mean, in all due respect to Jesus, we're not going to be Jesus, but we're the witness. Yes, right. We're the first opportunity that they get. And that takes an investment, you know, to jump over these, what we call these chasms, these walls, you know, in missiological terms, to jump over them. Uh, through language learning and cultural understanding, cultural acquisition, you know, le learning the the customs of a culture. You know, do you shake hands to greet? Do you do the Thai Y to greet? Uh, how do you show courtesies? How do you not insult people by your foreign ignorance? Um, <laughs> all of those things yeah. have relational impacts. That's a, that's a great adventure to go on. Yeah. And you're doing it because there's these human beings that have eternal value that's to right. God and he wants to communicate with them. And he's asking you to become the vehicle through whom he can communicate. That is right. And I like how you're bringing that to the forefront again. A lot of missionaries are struggling with their first term missionary attrition coming up. They'll probably head home, statistically speaking, many will. Um, but man, being that vehicle through whom God reveals himself many times, obviously in 1040 window for the very first time, I pray that people who are watching this and listening would be encouraged by your words in this conversation to say, yeah, I... I want to be that person who kind of yeah. lays aside my own ambitions, dying to self so that Christ really might be revealed in and through me. And man, you don't yeah. know uh, how far those ripples will last, even if it's a pebble in a placid pond. Right. Well, you compare, you know, compare the, the riches of those experiences, knowing that my life I had an eternal impact on others because of this investment I made. Compare that with buying a new car. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. when you say it like that, suddenly I lose all the excitement of that new car. It would have, it should uh, would have been nice. You really just ruined it for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're <laughs> glad for a new car. You know, I when when we lived in Thailand, we never had a new car. We bought used ones that were and, constantly and just, needed. Maintenance. Yeah, and just sprayed the new car scent in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but comparing the two, you know, there is no comparison with a, a new toy or a new fun thing compared to this impact that you can make on people's yeah. lives when you catch that vision. Um, that's the case that we're trying to make uh, what, you know, what miss, missionaries all over the world who have stuck to it and stayed there, what they've discovered, this, this amazing eternal impact you have on people. Well, but yeah. when you say that, I, I have to ask you, Doug, I mean, that takes a lot of effort to constantly be focused on intangibles. We live in a tangible world, right? We, we see the things that are physical and happening around us, but to focus always on the intangible is not, it's not an easy task. Is yeah. that, uh, how do we go about doing that? 
Well, I think one of the biggest ways we do that is keeping our relationship with Jesus through prayer and worship. Um, keep it sound. Um, I remember often in my own life when we went through difficult times in those intern years and then afterwards when we were trying to build a ministry, you know, I talked about the, the leader we work with. It took three years for him to have a breakthrough. What I was thinking after three years, I'm going to have a breakthrough when I pioneered. You know, well, it took us closer to five. Wow. And I remember going through some low times and difficulty. I'd go back to prayer. And in in times of prayer and in times of study and of worship, that's where the Lord would speak to me and guide me and say, I want you to make a change here. Why don't you try this? You know, I, if we don't have... A, a solid relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, the, the time, the difficult times will get the best of us. Hmm. I remember a, a missionary that went out with us to Central America some years ago. She was a school teacher, left her profession to go, go on mission. And she was having a difficult time raising money to go. And she was discouraged and would come to me and say, you know, I don't, this is hard getting, raising money. And am I really called? Did God really want me to go? And I told her, I said, I, here's what I want you to do. Uh, there's some, you know, there's some fundraising partnership development skills you can learn. But here's what you really need to do. I want you to go back home and spend some time in prayer. Get down on your knees and ask God, you know, what he's saying to you. And I said, come back and tell me. And she came back. She said, well, every time I get down on my knees, the Lord says, I've got this. I'm right. calling you. to this. Don't give up. <laughs> I, you know, it's just one of those things when we learn how to lean on Jesus and make him give him a, in a very practical way, uh, a part, give him a part of our lives so that we're listening. Uh, it's amazing. God has an ability to speak. And I think one of the, the tragedies of modern times is we're so distracted. You know, we're so distracted. We have so many distraction devices. I wear one on my arm. I carry one in my hand. You know, I, I have distraction devices all around me that that robs us of intimacy with Jesus. And we have got to to to, to slow down. You know, is it uh, Dallas Willard said, you know, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Um you know, so having those times of repose when we seek the Lord and allow him to speak, it's amazing what we'll hear. And it's amazing what will come into our spirits to empower us to do God's work. Amen. Yeah. Well, I think it's funny how you even have to say that uh, God still speaks as if he doesn't. You know, we need to be reminded of that because oftentimes our prayers are very one sided. And again, it brings me back to I remember um George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis often referred to him as his master, literarily. He said, man finds it hard to get what he wants because he does not want the best. God finds it hard to give to man because he would give him the best, but man would not have it. And so yeah, there's yeah. this disconnect in the heavenlies. And I think what your encouragement is, yeah, you're going to have all those distractions and devices, but can you take a moment to separate yourself from all these things, all these tangibles, and focus on, we would say, an intangible. But the reality is, the, the other world, this world that we're coming into, the heavenly realm is much more palpable and real than this facade that we're living in. And, oh, and yeah. it's so, so temporary, so transient, but God is calling us you know, to live for eternity, put eternity yeah. in our hearts. Mm-hmm. I, I, my own experience, you know, I, I remember when we were, we spent one year in India uh, in our, we had two internships. One was the one I referred to. And then the second one was a one year internship in India with another evangelist. And I remember we would spend two hours a day in prayer um, uh, during that time. Um, and he would pray on his own in his own room, you know, more than that. And I, I remember often he would weep. He would weep in prayer, you know, for for India. He'd pray for India, weeping for the people of India. And I was a young man. I was in my mid twenties, and I'm like, I feel pretty hard hearted in a prayer meeting here where somebody is weeping. <laughs> you know, I might I might complain about my own needs. You know, I felt like such a narcissist. You know, yeah. and all I care about is myself. And he's you, he's you not weeping prayer, but all. 
Yeah, you were uh, weeping in prayer, but all you're thinking about is your own uh, needs and discomfort, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. It's hot, or I don't have enough food, you know, or and meaning not the not food that I want. Sure, you know, and all these selfish things. And he's weeping for India. I, I felt. I just remember feeling so challenged, and I said, Lord, I want to. I want to weep for people. You know, I want to have a heart like that. I teach me. I had no idea, you know, what God would do to bring me through experiences that would break me and would soften my heart. And it's pretty dangerous now, prayer to pray. Yeah, it's a very dangerous prayer to pray, but it's it's one of the best things you could ever do because the the end result of that, if you can walk with God through the things that He does to shape your life and then have a broken heart for the nations and actually enjoy praying for nations and weeping for nations and crying out to God for nations. You have, you have a nearness and an intimacy with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit that pales every other passion, every other tangible thing we could have in life. It doesn't mean we don't need tangibles. You know, I'm happily married. I need my wife. You know, I need to get up in the morning and have breakfast and go to bed at night and have sleep. And we need stuff around us to get work done. So it doesn't mean you sure. you become this, this you become this um, reckless mystic on a on, yeah reckless mystic that sits on a mountaintop and does no earthly earthly good. No. Um, you, what it means is you become empowered by these transcendent realities that have to do with the presence and the heart of God that empowers you to live in a tangible world. Hmm. Yes, that is the key right there. Empowering yeah. the intangibles, empowering you to live in a tangible world. Yeah. Um, these, these, these things that you're sharing, I think are probably going to be stirring up people's hearts and they're thinking, well, I, I think I need to get in touch with this guy. You're probably going to receive thousands of emails. I don't know how big our listener <laughs> audience is going to be today. But um, how do people get in touch with Globe International? Uh, thus, you, I know you in the leadership uh, page, in the about section, you are listed there. But how do people get involved in uh, supporting either local missionaries or, or overseas missionaries through Globe International? And where would you point them to start doing that? The, the best place to start is at the Globe website, which is Globe, I-N-T-L, so short for international, or you can Google Globe International and it'll take you to the website, so globeintl.org. All the information is there. We're actually rolling out a, a whole new website in the next couple of weeks, so an upgraded uh, website will happen just very soon. My email is doug at globeintl.org, so it's very easy to get a hold of me. Um, I answer all my emails that are needing to be answered. You know, you know how you get other stuff that's just advertisements. I don't answer all those, but I do answer inquiries or I have one of my staff answer inquiries. So, yes, you will have a response if you have a question. Uh, I have a website, Doug Gaiman at dot coms. Uh, people can go to as well and, and buy my books, look at my blog, that kind of thing. Well, since you're doing shameless plugs, I'll help you out here. Make sure you head on over to Doug Gaiman, G-E-H-M-A-N.com. Uh, and obviously, your book is coming out really soon here. Um, go and make sure you look, uh, check on Amazon or anywhere, really, Before You Quit by Doug Gaiman. Um, you know, we're coming to kind of the close of all these thoughts. And it seems to me the theme of your life has found itself, found its way into this conversation yet once again. <laughs> I'm sure it finds itself into the conversation a lot of times. Perseverance, pushing through, stick grit. I think all those words would describe I like I like the thesaurus. I sometimes just hang out on thesaurus.com and you know. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can tell that if we were face to face uh, in the same uh, country or geographical coordinate, we'd probably um, have some good conversation because it seems like we read all the same stuff and hang out at thesaurus. dot com. I believe that's true. Yeah, it's probably true, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but I was going to say, you know. People are going through whatever they're going through in many difficult situations or glorious, but they need some deeper overarching purpose and goal here. And in closing, you've shared a lot of encouragement, a lot of inspiration. What would you say to that person who's probably on the precipice of a big decision? Um, maybe it's 
foreign missions, maybe it's supporting foreign missions, maybe it's uh, staying where they are and being a part of God's epic mandate uh, in their zip code, what is the encouragement you would bring people as we close here? Well, I, I think the first thing I would uh, encourage people to do is to slow down and seek God. Um, in, and I, I don't mean this to plug the book, but I had to really think about this in writing because the, you know, the publisher wanted me to put some wheels on perseverance. What are things people can do when they're in going through a hard time? And I, I really had to think about my own life. What did I do to survive some of the difficult things we went through? And we, we went through some difficult things. Our, my wife and I went through some really challenging things in our marriage. My, my brother committed suicide when we were living in Thailand. So I talk about it in the book. It was a grueling, grieving time for our family. Um, so we went through some of those plus other just ministry challenges. Um, and what did I, I had to ask myself, how did I get through? You know, how did I find my way and stay, stay centered um, in Jesus Christ? Because it's very easy when you're in a place of uncertainty or difficulty to go off the, to go off the road, to come off the rails. And this happens a lot in culture today. Our culture actually doesn't support staying in there. In fact, we kind of we kind of deride people who stay the course and think you need to be free. You need to bust what's not broken and and find your own truth, you know, and go your own way. And a lot of times that's defined by breaking things instead of staying in your commitments and staying on the path. So I had to think through that. What what did I do? Well. One was to read. Uh, I, you know, I read the Bible and I read other authors, Christian authors. That's basically the, the spiritual gift of teaching. You're, when you read other people's works, you're looking for insights uh, on your situation. So reading. Second is prayer and worship, you know, keeping your relationship with Christ uh, in a good place through prayer and worship. A third one was creativity. Uh, I've, I've always told people everybody has creative a creative part of their life. They have a creative gift that finds expression. And a lot of our, our angst is, is, um, is expressed in creativity. You think about the Psalms. They're not all just happy. Some of them are grieving Psalms. They're dealing with difficult. You're angry. Yes. Uh, You don't find blasphemy in scripture. You don't find pornography but you do find grief and difficulty, anger, and those are all just an expression of our a creative expression of what we're going through and doing it in front of God, basically. So I, I, um, I, when we were in difficult times, I expressed my creative and creativity in writing, songwriting, uh, music, different things that I have personal interest in. Some athletic activities. I actually picked up the sport of surfing um, in. Yes, because I just wanted to, you know, stay physically healthy. Um, it's one thing to just start smoking, you know, smoking drugs or taking drugs or or, or overeating. It's another thing to, to have a physical outlet that you can remain healthy. And I, I had to make a decision. I wasn't going to do unhealthy activities. I was going to do healthy activities. So creativity. And then the fourth one is just to what I call divert divert, which basically has to do with make sure you're looking at things that should change in your life and making decisions to change them. Uh, you know, just it's the Bible uses the word repentance. Uh, but I use the word divert, meaning basically make, make changes in your life where be open enough to look at things and change things. And sometimes even in finding a pathway, it's not abandoning the road, but it's, 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 Looking at something, what could I do differently as I'm moving towards this big goal? What could be, what could change? Um, and that can help people to stay on course, but make some changes. So uh, those are some things that I did in our time. And I would suggest to, to our listeners to, um, you know, find a way to be a learner and a seeker of God and create create and express your your passions through creative outlets healthy creative outlets i think a lot of people have to pause right here rewind five minutes and uh get a pen and paper out write some of those things down take some notes 
Uh, excellent yeah. encouragement. And uh, I think you're speaking to me as well, because okay. I know that for me, a uh, definite creative outlet is writing as well, shared with you. Um, if I'm not writing, there could be things pent up in my heart. That is how things express themselves. And uh, hence yeah. the reason why I hang out on thesaurus.com. Got a book inside me right now about brokenness and um, wanting to get that out because we just uh, yeah. have adopted a two-year-old girl for here from Thailand and our family oh. three has grown to a family of four. And inevitably, uh, adoption reveals brokenness, not only in the child you adopt, but in me. And uh, so there's many different thoughts and ideas and so yeah, perhaps some confusion along the yeah. way. But I think uh, what God is calling us to do is release those things to him in, in his presence, yeah. obviously. It's free yeah. from that. That's um, right. Yeah. Well, Doug, yeah. hey, I so appreciate you coming on Missions Pulse today. You All that you have shared seems to empower the motto of this podcast, know God's heart, join his mission. It is really that simple. When we know the heartbeat of God and sense that pulsation of what he's passionate about, it's quite inevitable that we follow then in, in the mission that he's given us and his overarching mission of all nations coming to him. So Doug Layman, or Doug Gaiman, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, just so appreciate you. Well, thank you, David. It's been my honor. I've enjoyed this this chat we've had. So thank you for inviting me. It's been a real honor to, to hang out with you this morning, this, this right. evening for you, this morning for me. <laughs> and, and whatever time it is for you watching and listening. Blessings, my friend. Missions Pulse. Know God's heart, join his mission. This podcast is powered by Within Reach Global. Subscribe, watch, and listen on YouTube today. Visit missionspulse.com.